Welcome to Alpha Wolf's Den. It's here that we seek enlightenment. Alpha Wolf Trading recognizes that the most successful companies in the world at one point had no earnings. There's a lot more to a company than just its earnings report. That's why here at Alpha Wolf's Den, we interview executive teams. We want to get to know management. We want to understand the vision, the mission, the strategic drivers, the plan. We want to separate fact from fluff. This is not a paid for promotion interview. This is solely wanting to know the company's vision, mission, their critical success factors, their strengths, their weaknesses, their opportunities, and the threats. We want to know the long-term objective and the tactical initiatives that leadership plans to implement to achieve success. We want to know about the company's debt, the cap structure, what it's going to take for them to become self-sustaining and stop burning through cash. We want to know management's previous failures, challenges, hurdles, how they overcame them, or what they learned that they can apply in their current role. We're trying to identify the risk and the reward. And oftentimes, it's strong leadership that makes the difference between success and failure. Here at Alpha Wolf Trading, we are looking for the hidden gems. And I hope you enjoy this interview because this is one of those companies that I think could be a hidden gem. Please understand that this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. This is not financial advice and I am not a financial advisor. Any investment that you decide to make in any security should be based upon your own due diligence and opinion. Hey everybody, Tim from Alpha Wolf Trading coming at you with another CEO interview. Uh, actually, Al Alejandro uh, from Power One Wireless. I fairly recent introduction, right? I just kind of started following the Tower One story, but when I met with, with Alejandro, he has a very compelling, uh, very compelling, kind of like a real estate play almost, uh, but in, a, in the form of a stock. So we'll kind of get to that in a second. Alejandro, I want to thank you for coming in, man, and, and taking the time to tell us your story. Well, thank you, Tim, for the opportunity. So, Tower One Wireless is is the name of the company. The ticker symbol on it is T O W T F, and we'll go over the chart later on uh, after we after we learn more about the company. But Alejandro, do me a favor and give me a little background on you, your history, and and how you got here, and and what your vision is for Tower One moving forward. Sure, sure, absolutely. So. Listen, my background has been principally uh, investment banking and institutional sales until about six years ago, where we took that skill set and launched our, our uh, you know, first company with veterans in the tower business, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, but part of that career has taken me a, a large part to Latin America, where a large portion of our business is set today. Um, and I was expanding into other markets as U.S., Canada and Germany. So we're excited about that. And. And that's basically how it, it jump started six years ago. Um, Tower One was 
launched out of Canada. Uh, we had our first country being Colombia, added Argentina, followed by Mexico, Ecuador, and uh, continue to add countries that you know create value for for us and what we do. And and what we do, Tim, is very very simple, right? I, you know, it, it's it's probably the easiest thing to explain in the sense that they're cell phone towers, right? And these cell phone towers are basically assets that for many, many years have been in the hands of the mobile carriers, right? And I'd say about 10, 10, 12 years ago, that changed, right? And the race for cell phone coverage now became more a race for capacity, content, and others. And many of these um, carriers, you know, the T-Mobiles of the world, the Verizons of the world started saying, well, listen, we can't depreciate this asset anymore, so let's sell it to someone and lease it back. And that's really what got going uh, uh, for the industry. And then, you know, new towers started to be assigned to groups uh, as such and allowing not only the tower, but also the expansion of that business into fiber, data centers and other, and basically a lease business back to the carrier. So what I mean by that is, is the following. Everything that we do is on long-term contracts, recurring revenue to the four or five clients that you have for every country, right? You don't have more than that in the United States. You have four carriers in Colombia, have four carriers in Mexico. You have three carriers in Canada. You have four carriers. So it's a very finite group of clients. And what we do for these clients in this very niche business is we focus on, you know, building and leasing back to them. So how that usually works is they'll have a need to build a site somewhere in, 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 in any country. Uh, and that'll be a GPS coordinate with a radius around that GPS coordinate and a height requirement that, that they need, right? And from there, we basically go out, we search for the site, we lease the property or buy the property, and we build a tower. The construction of a tower is sub-30 days, right? So it's a very small process, um, but we do so in volume uh, across different markets. Um, and, you know, for the tower business today, here's the most shocking the number one United States REIT today in size is actually a tower focused business, right? And and then that's very different to what everyone's accustomed to of seeing, you know, class A buildings or warehouses or self storage. It's now digital infrastructure, right? And as we transition from three to four, four to five G, the need is more, the demand is more, and the business has become, you know, not only it started in the US, but has now become something global across all markets, right? It makes absolutely no sense for carriers to go out and build their own tower when I can build a tower and actually rent it to three or four tenants, right? So our average tower, we build uh, for three tenants and it's our job to basically lease that up, right? So we never build a tower without an anchor tenant. We don't build spec towers. We don't go, you know, hope to maybe lease it. We do it because we have an order and that order is firm, right? And that guarantees us that- And, that, and that's, tenant, a, and that's uh, a long-term- what, what's the typical length of the contract? Sure. So all the contracts, and, and this, is, this is what's going to become very interesting when we get to that. Every contract has a minimum 10-year forcible contract, right? So there's no way out of those contracts. But what the industry has shown is these towers are in nature perpetual. And, and here's what I mean by that. Number one, the life of a tower, this is steel, right? Galvanized steel going up in every city. Um, whether they be macro sites or rooftops or small cells or, you know, di different infrastructure, they're permanent and, 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 and have a long life. Uh, the ability for a network to operate requires that all these, you know, we can look at it like a big spider web, requires for all these sites to be in order for it to be able to work properly, right? So they're permanent in nature, right? And the reason why uh, you know, you see big private equity getting involved in this business. You see pension funds getting involved in this business is the long-term recurring revenue with investment grade customers, right? Customers such as AT&T Mexico, T-Mobile, Telefonica from Spain, Vodafone and others. These are solid customers that, you know, have an, uh, a, a intent to lease this space and they save. And the reason they save is number one, they're not putting out the CapEx, we are. Number two, if a second tenant shows up, they get a discount and they share the ground lease, right? 
And number three, the fiber that's taken to these towers is shared rather than everybody doing their own civil works, right? So the mathematics makes sense for them, uh, and, 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 and hence why this industry is, is, uh, is rolling today. And it's a very finite niche business, right? So let let, me, ask, let me ask you a question while yeah. I'm thinking about it. Uh, on, on the fiber, you just mentioned the fiber that's going to the tower. Is yeah. there enough bandwidth for, for there to be, you know, four carriers on, on that fiber? Sure. I mean, look, fibers have basically different strains, right? So, you know, fiber as, as thick as a, uh, as a, as a hair, um, it basically transport a, a lot of that and, and be able to, you know, for not only power up that tower, but service any community that they're sitting on. Right. So there's different companies that their business models principally, uh, fibers. Some guys are principally tower. Some guys have a mix of towers and fiber. But the, the thesis behind it is that both the fiber and the tower are shareable infrastructure that no operator should dig into their pockets that owned by themselves. Right. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, the way the industry started was many of these guys had already depreciated the asset a hundred percent and said, well, what do we do? I mean, you know, let's free up some cash. Let's sell it to one of these tower codes. They'll pay us and we'll still continue to use it. So, you know, uh, life goes on with that. Okay. So uh, there's a couple of things that have come up recently. So, you know, the, the airport, I'm sure you're watching what's going on with this 5G in the airports and the airport Absolutely. planes. So what's your, what's your take on that? What's your opinion on that? What it would, do you have one on that? I mean. Absolutely. So I think that look, 5G is, is definitely something new. I would say that in the, in the U S even though the carriers have gone out to, you know, the market 5G, it was only until last year that we actually had 5G ready phones. I'd say in the U S we're basically at the bottom of the first inning. We haven't even got it started with respect to the 5G deployment, right? Uh, there's a select amount of cities that, that have done, you know, spotty networks, but the reality is that what is required for 5G is a densification of that tower infrastructure. So regular towers, three, four G on average, you know, let's say two miles apart from each other, three miles apart from each other, you know, 5G sites have to be 200 feet apart from each other, right? So. In, in that picture that you're showing there, you know, you, what the type of infrastructure you start seeing in your cities is the picture on the bottom right. Um, and, and that's, um, and, and you'll see sprinkled uh, across every, uh, every city, right? Where they start is regularly the, the, um, the, the big hubs where, you know, higher population. And as we, you know, expand out, they'll be able to, uh, you know, cover other areas. But I think that, you know, that FAA uh, question that's going on right now with the interference of, of 5G is something that has to be looked into and something that will be resolved. I don't think it's something that's going to be permanent in nature or stop anything. Uh, with respect to Europe, look, they're already at 25, almost 40% deployment, right? Well, we're at like less than 10% in the really? US. Not, not, not to even mention Latin America, where, it, where it's at 0%, right? So, so, so and, and let, a lot you, of people you, say, yeah. You brought up the spider web, right? So, you have an existing spider web with towers right now, but with the 5G, it's like a spider web within the spider web, right? That's exactly right. So now you, you're, you're going to put a lot more towers so that you have those, that 200-foot right. rate, you know, uh, right. proximity, right? And, 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 and the reason why is basically the, the technology. There, when you went from 2 to 3, 3 to 4, four you know, G, it was considerate waves of, of, of signal that went out. The difference between that and 5G is that the equipment now has a laser technology, right? So it's from, from the tower directly to your handheld, right? So it's, you know, it's a laser, right? So there's no way to get that laser if you're two miles apart, right? I mean, you have interference from buildings and trees and whatever have you. Um, so that's why they have to be, uh, uh, close to each other. Yeah. So that, so that's, that's what helps, uh, the latency issue, right? So the more, t because you've got the, the tower, right. it's almost like edge computing. You've got, you've got the, Absolutely. the tower real close to proximity. So that enables it to be able to transfer faster because it's not as long of a, a transaction, right? Or, or a that's transition, it. I guess. Okay. So, I, you know, so that, that, that's the exciting 5G is going to be a lot of demand of new sites, new fiber. Um, you know, we're in position, uh, with, with our customers today. We have the re reputation to do so. And 
just to give you a little bit of color with respect to the history of the company, you know, we've done one one equity raise and have on the back of that raised over seventy five, eighty million dollars worth of private money. Right. And I think that what makes that very interesting for small cap investors, especially, is that there's not this influent, you know, dilution that that, that goes out and that continues. To Who's happen. your largest shareholder? It's a bit. Me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so. So. So the 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 reason why 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 I mentioned that is because it's bankable. And the reason why it's bankable is they're non cancelable 10 year contracts with investment grade customers. Right. So. Versus other small caps where, you know, you're raising equity and raising equity, raising equity. What I have to do here is raise 25% of the equity and banks all fill in 75%. So that's how we got to as high as $80 million of capital raising. So I think that's something also important to highlight to the investors, right? Because, you know, to build, to go out and get these awards, you know, right now we have 200 towers in operation, uh, you know, over 80 million bucks raised, five countries open, you know, over 75 employees now. Um, We've had a temporary, and then I say that temporary because it was only for two years. We had a, a, a transaction with one of the Blackstone companies with the Phoenix Towers. Uh, so it was able to show the market that we also sell institutional product, right? Uh, so now we have our principal bank being Banco Itaú, the largest, uh, you know, uh, Latin America bank. Um, so, you know, big, big companies that invest in the, in the space, uh, today and that are fueling our, our growth, uh, locally, right? So, each tower, just as a as an example, an average tower will be let's call it a thousand dollars a unit, a hundred thousand dollars a unit, right? Uh, to to that build, tower for to build, tower, right? Yeah, to build, to build, to build. Okay. That tower, on average, will yield cash on cash, unlevered, twelve percent, right? But that's one tenant, right? Two tenants get you to twenty-four. Three tenants increases uh, that much more, right? But that's not even the exciting part. Here's the exciting part. The exciting part is what these towers are valued for, right? So technically, I can build a tower for $100,000. And in today's market, and it's been going on for a while, pension funds, private equity will take it off your hands. We use a multiple industry called tower cash flow. But to simplify it, with one tenant, it's a double. With two tenants, it's a triple. And with four tenants, it's that much more, right? So every dollar we invest... If we are able to take it to, let's say, 2.1 tenants per tower, that over a four or five year period is a 10x on, on equity, right? And I think that's what gets people excited about towers. Uh, and the reality is that our, the difference between our business model and, and, and the other public peers is that their focus is predominantly we buy towers. And I say, well, great, I build towers, right? Because a lot of people ask me the question, well, how do you compete against a company that's a $125 billion market cap? <laughs> right? And that's a... And that's, you know, one of the top three questions I get. And the reality is, I don't. And they say, well, why not? I said, very simple. They buy, I build, right? So when I build 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 towers, they can knock at the door and take them off my hands, or I can keep on holding them and keep building the company as we are doing today. So when I mentioned that, you know, Blackstone Phoenix transaction, uh, that's what we did. And that's what, you know, created that, that, that credibility for our company is when I would tell people, listen, you, you know, we buy a tower for, we build a tower for 100, we can sell it for 250, 350 over 24 months. People say, how's that going to happen? And my response is, well, I've done it. And here's where I've done it in Mexico, I've done it in Colombia, I've done it in Argentina. So there's a track record that, that we've been able to assemble selling towers at those multiples um, that that not only enable to, to show the, you know, the cash flow, which is, as you've seen, you know, consistently grown. But the most important is the NAV, the, the value creation that we continue to have, right? So listen to this. We have a backlog of 450 towers, right? Yep. If we get to 1.5 tenants, 1.7 tenants per tower, right? Yep. And the TCF that would be anywhere between 5 to $6 million on an annual basis, that portfolio is plus $100 million market cap. And you're at $6 million market cap today. So my liquidation See? values... 10x, 10x my trading value, I guess. No, no, no. So, so let's let, let me let me. So, I'm looking at your slide. I don't know when this deck was done, but it said you had 179 towers in yep. service, and you just said a few seconds November. ago that you've got 200, right? Is that yep. so? Now you you right. and that. So when was this deck done? This deck was done. It was probably October, October, November. Okay, and now you're 
you're growing 20, 20 over 25 towers to yeah. over 200, yeah. right? Yeah. 450 you already have in backlog. How long does yeah. it take to, to um, build the tower? How, how long does that take? So from, 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 from start to finish, I would, I would call it six months, right? But the actual construction where the CapEx is spent is 30 days. So what happens in that six month period, right? You get the coordinates, you go find the property, you negotiate the lease, you pull the permits, you order the tower, you build the tower, right? So that is the same cut and paste we do month to month every day. And here's what, what, what's important. One of the things that we've done most recently over the last year is we, you know, rather than waiting for quarterlies and annuals and all that, what we've decided to do is basically put out a monthly construction report to all our shareholders or, or anyone that's following us, right? So that shows you the, the speed at what we continue to, to, to grow towers at. And, you know, if people do the simple math, start saying, well, hold on, well, 20 more towers, so much that, so much equity, so much value. <laughs> this, is, this, is what I, this is what I want to do. So um, if I, if you just, if you just built the 450 towers and you only had yeah. one tenant, What's the right. uh, at what at what point does that tower become break even to cash flow positive? How long does it take so, to get there? So if you look at it on the, so this is important to, to, to explain. So if you look at it at, at the company, right? Yep. Today ninety percent of our S G and A is because we have people in our offices that are designing towers that are pulling permits. Right. Right. If I were to stop building today and have 450 towers uh, built, right? Yep. We could be collecting seven, eight million dollars net a year for the next 20. Right. But yep. since the game plan is continued to add more value with more towers, right? Um, you become cash flow even. I'd say at about 300 towers. So we're about a hundred hours away from from calling it, you know, break even, right? But at but the acquisitions of towers and and and, and how they value this asset is always done on an asset level basis, right? So any buyer doesn't care about the back office, the team, the ERP system. Their focus is okay. You got towers. What's the cash flow? That's the value, right? So to find companies that are that, that are technically willing to purchase these assets at anywhere between fifteen to twenty times. On, 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 a, on, a, on an asset basis in Latin America, and listen to this, 25 to 30 times in Europe and the U.S. Uh, for a 10-year contract is is, uh, is important. Right. So if, you just, so if you just start to do the math and you say, okay, what are the odds that, so what, right now it says average per, your tenants per tower is 1.2, right? What that means is basically 20% of my towers have a second tenant. So 20% of my towers yield more than 24%. Yeah. Right. So if you get, so if we go to two tenants per tower, that it dramatically increases the, the time frame in which you're break even. Not, not only that, but not only that, but listen to this. The most important part is getting that second tenant or that third tenant requires zero additional capex. I already made the cash outlay on the first run of the first. You already tenant. pulled the permits. So, you already did all that stuff. That's the it. tower is so there, just, and, it's and, not and going solve. away, and it's going to be needed, <laughs> right? That's right. Okay. Absolutely right. So it's like having renters that are never going to die, are never going to move. Digital because... digital infrastructure of guys that are never going to move from well-known brands, right? So what, if, if people just look at, you know, a great example, and, and I use it now because we all talk about COVID every day. Right. Pull the charts on REITs. Of buildings, malls, self storage, and pull the pull the the charts on REITs for the tower space. And if anything, we got a bump up from COVID, right? Uh, you know, because we have no people going to our to our asset. We we have no people going to the asset. We don't have like, you know, so so the difference between that and and regular REITs, you know, they got five year leases, that ten year leases, twenty year leases. You know, you know, buildings get old. Towers are equal. They've been equal for forty years, right? You know, they have people that, that, that they have to worry about masks and entries and, and, and this. I have a I have an asset that's you know out, out in the uh, out in any community, rain and sun, no problem, right? So maintenance is very very uh, very small, less than five percent a year of the value of the rent. So so basically.
basically, if you, if you look at our takeaway from, from our top line, our, our gross rents at an asset level basis, we keep 90% of what we make, right? And the remainder of that, obviously, we use to fuel additional growth, expand different countries, build new towers, and so forth. And if you think about the other effect that COVID has had, right, is the consumption of video, right? Yep. Because now everybody, I mean, and I don't think we're going back. I, I really don't think we're going back. I think companies have figured out that you can be extremely efficient. What used to take you five days to go to five different meetings in five different right. towns can now be done in yeah. five hours, right? So, yeah, and, 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 and the interesting part about that is that that creates more demand for more infrastructure, right? So what happens is, you know, sometimes people are like, well, hold on, I have three, four bars on my phone and I can't get a call out. I can't send an email. What, you know, internet's slow. Well, that's not a coverage issue. That's a capacity issue. And that's what we mean by densification. So the continuous demand of infrastructure is, is big, right? Hey, Tim, I have to fortunately jump here, but do we continue on Monday and, and put the rest right, of this look, together? Let's do this. Edit? I don't want this to be the end of the interview. So we're going to have to do a part two. Okay? Monday? Let's figure it out. It. I'll, I'll do it whenever, man. man. I'll do it on Monday. Whatever, Monday. It doesn't matter to me. Or, or tomorrow. Or tomorrow. I'll, I'll do, do it tomorrow, tomorrow with you, and we'll, that way we won't have any interruptions. Okay, All right, let's do it. I'm in. I'm in. All right, uh, we'll 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 figure it out. I'm gonna end this. All right, but this isn't the end. This can't end like this. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> All right, we'll do it. Hey everybody, uh, this is part two of the <laughs> meeting that I was doing with uh, Alejandro uh, this morning, and you know, unfortunately, we ran out of time. And I did not have enough time to, to cover all the things I want to cover. So fortunately, Alejandro has agreed to come back and do a part two. This is the part two. We're starting it right now. And we're going to pick up where we left off and cover all the things I want to cover. <laughs> Alejandro, thanks for coming back. I appreciate it, man. I'm glad we're doing it today because I really I want to try and get this out this weekend. Uh, but I think we're one thing I was looking at we really didn't kind of go over, we were talking about the towers. We didn't talk about, we talked about how much it costs to put them up. We didn't talk about the maintenance or site management or anything on that level. How much is, the, I mean, I see that you guys do schedule a maintenance, right? Sure. What, what's the sure. cost of upkeep? Not much, right? And and I think it's uh, like, like I mentioned that on, on the first part, uh, it's marginal, right? The only, the, the expenses, and I think there, there's a slide to that. Um, I'll tell you what page it was, so I, it can just outline, you know, some of the costs that are, if you go up, um, you'll see that, you know, some of the costs, right? Yep, there you go. There we so go. In the middle there, you'll see the different expenses that are part of a tower, right? And they're marginal in nature, which predominantly are insurance for the tower. And second to that is the maintenance, right? And the maintenance on a tower is none, right? Because we are not responsible for the equipment and we are not responsible for the fiber. So I joke around sometimes and I call it dumb steel, but the reality it's very smart steel, right? But we're, we're not responsible for any of the active equipment. So anything that's on that tower, right? Like you it's see on that- It's responsible for the now, carrier, right? It's the carrier, right? So the right. carriers are the ones that do the maintenance on that equipment. And they're the ones that take on that cost on our side. Number one, we pay the insurance, and number two, the marginal experience, the marginal expense of maintenance, which on a new tower, for which is galvanized steel, is slim to none, right? You know, cutting of the grass, making sure you know it's a you know safe environment for a technician to come in and do their work on the carrier's equipment, right? So they don't want to see you know six foot tall grass that you know will make a technician nervous, getting snake bites or things of that nature. So it's, like I said, it's very small to uh, the, the marginal, right? Not more than 15% max between that insurance and that maintenance. Okay. Okay. So I think where we left off, we were talking about, um, well, actually we were kind of getting into the good stuff, which was the, you know, if you just built out the 450, and you only had one carrier, right? But if as you start adding new carriers, 
the the math starts to really uh, I, I almost want it starts compounding, right? So you, you get the profitability break even much much faster, right? Correct. And these towers aren't going away; <laughs> they're going to be needed know. regardless. You do have some big players out there in the field that you're competing against, but you were making the point that you're really kind of not competing against them. That's right. Is because you build them. Right. So, so the, the, I guess the challenges that, that we've seen and, and they're actually positive challenges, you know, you'll get the odd call from a pension fund saying, Alex, I'll give you $200 million. What would you do? I said, well, for me to deploy $2 million, it's going to take two, three years where I can buy something that'll take me, you know, a, a, a couple months. But the reality when you go out and buy towers is now you're looking at a single digit yield, right? When I build towers from scratch, I have a double digit yield, right? So while I'm building towers, um, you know, for a hundred thousand, my competition has to buy them for 250, 300,000, right? Uh, in, in plain vanilla that, you know, we, we get the bump up on, on having, you know, built that tower from scratch. Right. So the idea is to continue to build that. And then, you know, as we mature as a company, I think there will be opportunities for acquisition in other markets. Um, and at that point, I think combining acquisitions with built to suit, I think it makes a lot of sense. Right. But I think right now we've picked our, our, our fight uh, at this level and, and we're doing very well at it. Um, and, and it's an area, like I said, that the larger tower companies uh, tend to not go into because, you know, while they're busy striking $100, $200 million checks every month, I'm busy striking four or $5 million every month, right? So that's a big, big difference. But at the end of the day, same towers, same countries, same client, same terms, same logic. That's it, right? right. Um, so. Okay, so the, so the strategy, I mean, 450 is what you have. You, you have so building, building out 450 uh, additional to the 200 already takes us to 650 towers at an average of a thousand dollars of, of tower cash flow for each tower your exit on that type of, of uh, towers you're looking at single tenant 140 million dollar exit right obviously 140 minus the debt that you've stacked on right um, so you know there's there's you know a, a large space for growth uh, as we also add on other businesses such as fiber, right? So a, a direct segue in, in our business is fiber. And the reason why is today I build a tower and for the carrier, they're having to coordinate fiber to the tower, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to power up that equipment. I think that we're looking at a couple transactions right now that would create a ton of value for us uh, where instead of them coordinating that fiber to the tower, I coordinate the fiber to the tower, right? And basically that fiber to the tower will have identical terms to the towers, which are basically shared infrastructure of fiber, long-term leases. The only difference is instead of being vertical, it's horizontal. That's it. Um, so uh, what about yeah. <laughs> What about insurance on your? So I'm I'm thinking about fiber, and I'm just thinking about if you're the. So are you, are you are you, not the fiber company? You're the you're, just essentially getting a, fiber provider to put it. To, uh, explain that what you're what you're kind of looking at. Oh, so so what 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 happens is this: a, a tower has three ways to you know get signal, right? Okay, but it's, it's your fiber, right? That's the best right. course of business. You got microwave. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you got satellite. Right. No one uses satellite. So, you know, you got microwave. Right. And microwave for rural is very, you know, it's very practical because you have long distances you have to cover and, and, and that's fine. But for urban areas, you need the fiber. Right. And what that would entail is basically dropping fiber from the tower to the nearest connection of fiber. So if I were to map out any city for you across really the planet, there's tons of fiber ducts going through in and around the cities everywhere. So tying into that, and there's companies you subcontract for that, right? Now, after we subcontract those, those, those companies, um, I'm left with an asset, which is fiber, that I can now lease to tenant one, tenant two, tenant three, 
right? Okay. So it's similar. It's identical to my tower business. In my tower business, everybody says, well, how many crews do you have? And I say zero. Well, what do you mean? Who builds them for you? Well, I have subcontractors that build it for <laughs> So we're not heavy on trucks and bucket ladders and, and nails and going out there and building stuff. We just sub that out, right? You finish the tower, you get paid. You don't finish the tower, you don't get paid. Um, so that's how we operate across more than five countries now. And, and it uh, continues to work. And we want to, you know, obviously expand into that fiber area. Uh, when you now have the fiber area, now you now you have the the logical question is, well, what are you going to do with edge computing? What are you going to do with data centers, right? Which are two other action items that everyone's quite uh, active about uh, with the same logic: long-term leases, investment grade off takers, recurring revenue, shared infrastructure, right? Um, but today we've we've been focused solely 100% on towers. Okay. All right. So let's talk about, let's talk about the cap structure real quick. Uh, and, and if there's anything that you feel like you really want to emphasize, right. Let, let's, let's do it. I mean, I want to try and dumb this thing down as, as yeah, much listen, as possible. I think, I, I think that the, the most important message I, I would say, Tim, is understanding the value of a tower, right? Because the top question every shareholder always makes across any industry is what's your top line? What's your bottom line? What's your EBITDA, right? Those are the three questions you, you know, everyone will ask that. And it doesn't even matter what industry, you got to ask the same question, right? Right. Uh, in the case of this business, you, you have to kind of segue away from that. And, and the reason why is it's all about NAV here, right? So, you're building towers for X that are valued at Y, right? And that's why we put out these construction reports, right? So everybody, instead of looking at the stock price, obviously the stock price is important, but rather than worry if the stock's up, down, or sideways, it's, hey, hold on. We just added another 20 sites to the portfolio. 20 sites times 1,000 towers a month times 12 months times a multiple of 18 gives you what? Oh, wow, we just created three, $4 million dollars of NAV for, for, for this company. And then you do it the next month and do it again. And that's eight. And then when people start looking at a market cap of six, seven, eight, they start scratching their heads and what's going on here. Right. And I think that part of the challenge that we've had has been that, right. When they, when somebody looks at these micro caps or small caps, what's their revenue? Oh, okay. And, 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 and instead of looking at just the revenue, if you understood towers, um, you would basically say, okay, well, hold on, time out. How many towers, what do they generate? And here's what they're worth, right? It's, it, you know, sometimes it's, it, it's frustrating. And that's why I, I think this outreach is important to, to investors to educate them. Uh, we get offers from private equity. Listen, Alex, we'd give you $80 million, take it private. We'll back you with 200, take it private, do this, do that. You know, but my, my thought process, well, hold on, time out. I think we have to do a hard work of going out there and telling the story because my, my peers that are publicly traded, since they start off by striking $300 million in acquisitions of, you know, single digit yields, you know, obviously they have critical mass from day one, right? So that, that, that becomes easier, uh, easier sell than saying, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm putting four or $5 million on a monthly basis. Right. But I think that if you look at the, the, the initial slides where we showed, the growth from zero to five countries, zero to 75 employees, zero to 200 to 4 million to six to eight to 10 million in rev. You know, it's, it's all, you know, consecutive, you know, consistent uh, increase on all fronts. Right. Right. Uh, and, and the fact that we've successfully been able to also sell towers to prove out those multiples is also critical and of who we sold it to. Right. Because if it would have been me selling it to ABC, COVID, it was one of the Blackstone companies. Right. So we didn't fool them. Right. I mean, it's a very uh, interesting asset and people love uh, love investing in it. Right. So this is a I would say that this is a number one. This is a patience story. Right. And the, the critical component that you have to pay attention to is that every one of those towers that is being built is signed to a long term contract. It's right. not that you're just throwing it up to throw it up and hope no, somebody's no. going to come along. They're already there. You've got them, right? You have a locked in, guaranteed anchor tenant. We, we build no spec anything. 
right? We build it because there's a tenant. And then it, in our sales effort, our job is to add a second and a third tenant, right? You're not guaranteed the second. <laughs> which and are third those, tenant. which, you know, look, if you never get one, you never get one. Okay. You still have the tenant. And then, but sure. the kicker is if you do get one, that's just like gravy. And right? it's big gravy, right? Because it's almost, I would say it's almost even more valuable in the sense that you have to put zero additional cash outlay, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, I already, you know, the cost of, when I say that the number 100,000, the cost is already a tower for three tenants. If I were to build a tower for just one tenant, Maybe it wouldn't cost me a hundred. Maybe I could do it for 50. Maybe I can do it for 60. But what I'm saying is that I've already made a capital investment that will facilitate, you know, adding that second and third immediately without any issues. And today we're at 1.2, which translated to, to, to practical numbers means 20% of our portfolio has a second tenant, right? right. Which means 20% of our portfolio is yielding plus 20% and more, right? Um, so... Yeah, and, we're and happy about that. We'll, we'll go back to what we talked about earlier, which is you have an incre increasing demand because sure. of 5G, because of COVID, because of just how business sure. is going to continue to get done for the future, right? Sure. So the demand is there. The need is there. I mean, you have 450 on backlog. Is that all you're going to do? You're done after four hundred? No, no, no. no. We're, we're we're done in Ecuador. We have another, you know, to add to add to that another sixty that we're adding to that, and and we continuously refill that backlog also, right? So, I think, look, you know, just, just like you and me met, right? I don't have the opportunity sometimes to spend 20, 30 minutes giving this explanation, but once I explain it, you know, a lot of people say, okay, now I get it, right? Because if you just look at the the financials and on the cover, you say, well, hold on, a six million dollar market cap. Why is a six million dollar market cap company? How did they raise eighty million dollars privately? Well, that, that's a question, right? The second question is, well, what's the top line, right? Because that's what everybody always asks, right? And and the, the the right question for somebody that invests in the tower, and I, I think that's what we have to do is bridge bridge the questions to the industry, right? And what's important here is how many towers, how much tower cash flow, and and that's what really creates the the the. Um, the angle. So that slide there that you're showing, the highly attractive power model, I think is is uh, is, is is very interesting, and it basically outlined. I think the, the one prior to that. Um, this one. No, the, the one on top of that. So you, you see you? there that you know you have that investment into the tower, right? Right. Uh, but when you add the second tenant and the third tenant, look at how obviously that yield increases, right? Because you're not having to do any additional capex, right? So one tenant, two tenants, three tenants, right? The ground where we post or where we build our towers, I'd say 90% of it is leases. 10% of it we actually acquire. But on the ones that we lease, it's a full pass through to our customer. So I leased Tim's backyard for a thousand bucks. Well, I don't have to pay the thousand bucks. The carrier does, right? Um, obviously, I have to manage you know, the, the, the land lease and, and, and that, but let, you know, it's not a, a, an expense to me, right? Right. If I had the opportunity to buy Tim's backyard, well, then guess what? I would have an ability to bill on it, but then I'd also have to have the CapEx to buy the piece of property, right? Um, so that, that, that's important. Then on the next slide is, is, I think, you know, without leverage, right? The impact of selling a tower with a single tenant at the multiples that we sell, right? And then look at the look look at the uh, uh, what happens if if you're doing that with leverage, which is the next slide, and how that over a time period becomes that much more exponential, right? And the reason why is if you can basically add that second tenant or not, right? Um, and do it seventy five percent at twenty five percent equity, you know, it's basically a, a levered re equity return that's very exciting, right? You don't find these returns on any other real estate asset, right? right. And that's what makes it very, very, very interesting. Um, um, so that's why we focus on that BC BTS, right? So I build a tower for, call it 100,000, literally over, you know, uh, upon being built, 
you know, we, we have a big lift on, 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 on that, right? And you can see it on this example, example here. And let me see if I can expand that presentation so I can actually read. Um, actually, let, let me do this. Yeah, there you go. Maybe the one below that, and I'll walk everyone through through the simple through the model. I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna cover the whole damn screen. Okay, go ahead. You did. All right. So the next, the next slide. Next one. Yeah. All right. Okay. Here you have a tower, one hundred and five thousand dollars, right? Right. Initial spending yield 12 percent, right? So there's eleven percent, right? Debt seventy eight thousand, equity twenty six or twenty thousand, right? Yeah, two thousand three sixteen. Cost to build is one hundred five two sixty three. There you go. So the initial tower rent, right? When, when you see initial, then you see at the end of year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, right? What we did on this model was basically say, hey, out of every 100 towers, I'm only going to add a second tenant to 15 of them, right? And let that accumulate through time. But if we were to just look at the initial, right, upon being built, the day after being built, right? Yeah. And you walk through the tower cash flow, the 11,000 and change, you multiply that, times your multiple, and you extract the debt, you're left with a... Pretty interesting. <laughs> Four and a half X on your right. equity investment. Right. Like day one. Right. There's no real estate asset doing that. Now, that's because of the leverage. And as you add the, the, the tenants, right? And if you scroll over to year five, right? And let's assume we have 1.75 tenants per tower. That basically see 11.7 X on your equity. Right, right now. Everyone in the penny stock world and in the small cap and micro cap are always talking about 10 baggers. Well, I have a 10 bagger in my own way, <laughs> <laughs> but it requires some explaining, right? Right. And, and, and look, that's, that's the whole point. That's why you came back for part two, right? That's right. I wanted to make sure we clearly uh, is, and as simply as possible explain this story right? right because in a way i mean right now yeah you're you're in the you're in the beginning portion but those towers they're they're backlog i don't know how else to say that they're backlog yep. that means they're coming right and, and and not only backlog then here let me add something else to it fully financed to build so it's not like we're short we're short cash here to 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 go build them we we already secured the financing and I think you can see it on our recent pre press releases from Banco Itaú. You're in debt for nine and a half years, right? Right. Um, so not only is it our, our, our contractual backlog, but by the way, it's fully financed, right? So look, I think it's a buy at, 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 these, uh, at these times, whatever, which way you want to value it. You got another slide on the back that'll show you, you know, recent tower transactions and, and, and what they've sold for and, and, and why, why we think it's, you know, uh, very, very interesting, right? Yeah. Um, so. so you're focused on uh, Mexico, Colombia. Those are your... Yeah, so, so Colombia, and Mexico, or, uh, Colombia, Mexico, Ecuador, are where we have the majority of our, of our backlog today. Okay. Uh, but we're also happy to announce that we're, we're starting to build for TELUS in Canada. And uh, we've started the company in Germany. So... Those countries will be, and, and by the way, one of the reasons we started in Latin America versus North America was also the following. When I looked at going down this course of, of business, uh, this course of financing, of being public, you know, you had a couple opportunities at the beginning, which were, listen, you can do it by, via private equity. I said, no, I want to do it via public. And the reason I want to do it public is there is no entry into any small or mid cap tower company in the planet. Okay. There isn't, they don't exist. It's either a private equity fund that owns an infrastructure fund and one of 200 investments is a tower company, or it's American Towers, SBA, Crown Castle, you know, $160, $250 stocks, $125 billion market cap, right? So private equity or good life size stocks. And I said, well, hold on. 
Why can't we do a small cap? Why can't we do a, 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 a or as I like to be humble and say a nano cap uh, <laughs> and, right. and build it up, right? I think there's, there, there's, there's a crowd for that. There's, there, there's investors for that. And once the fundamentals are right and you execute it, then we should continue to build this thing, uh, build this thing along. And, you know, when, when, when we started that in Latin America, we did so because what's important about, I think any, any public company, especially when you're a small public company is being able to show advance, being able to show, you know, that, that you're moving forward. Right. And the problem, and the problem with, with, with Canada and Germany as a start, it was very simple. It takes two years for, to get a permit. So who would get excited about, well, I'm going to invest in a tower company. And when are you <laughs> going to build the first tower? Well, it'll be about 2024, 2025. Whoa. Right. So here we were able to basically, you know, you get permits in Latin America, zero to 90 days versus two years in Germany. Right. So there was no way to start 